to production. From yeast to nutrients to stabilization and filtration, we dip into the Scott Labs vault of over 80 years of experience to bring you the latest in research and technical applications. Today's a real treat because we have not one, but two seasoned experts in the field of tannins and oak, Kathy McGrath and Cynthia Coleman, both of Scott Labs. Kathy was born and raised in South Africa where she graduated from the University of Natal. Her career started on a wine estate in the South African wine lands and eventually led her through Europe and China, I mean, sorry, Europe and Chile, ultimately landing in the US. Kathy started with Scott Laboratories in 1996 as a fermentation product manager, rejoining in 2007 to focus on new product development and trials within the enology and fermentation department. Cynthia, she brings 25 years of experience in the wine industry, including international sales, as well as over two decades at Behringer Vineyards, which is Treasury Wine Estates, where she worked in winemaking research, sensory program, as well as operations. While there, she also managed oak alternatives and barrel purchases for the entire winery network, including Europe. In addition to that, lumber brokering is a family operation. Today's talk is to try and help you negotiate the seemingly limitless options of using tannins and oak in the finishing of your wine, or any beverage for that matter, starting with something obvious like building mouthfeel or gaining body and oak notes and helping with a bunch of other things that tannin and oak can do, like mitigating green or unripe characters, balancing against astringency or bitterness, or increasing the perception of sweetness and lowering the perception of alcohol. As this title of this talk suggests and the speakers reiterate, crossing the finish line is when the packaging happens. So you need to start thinking about it way before then. Who hasn't tasted something and realized too late that it could really use a little oomph or a little touch of spice? So today we're going to touch on what, why, and how of finishing with tannins, oak, or both, and the timeline you should keep in mind when thinking about tweaking your product, using these natural products to produce natural drinkability. As usual during the talk, I will be posting several quick polls for you to answer. And as always, make sure you can see the audio settings on the lower left, along the bottom, the raise hand and the Q&A buttons. These will be the main channels for your communication. And if you have any questions that occur to you during the talk, feel free to post the questions on the Q&A section. We will try and answer the question after the presentations, both. So I'm, um, after Kathy is gonna speak and then Cynthia, and we'll answer the questions after Cynthia. Your questions will be anonymous. I'll be looking for raised hands if you'd like to ask your question live. We will also be recording this webinar and we'll be making it available if you wanna revisit, revisit any of the topics discussed. I've said this before that sometimes in winemaking, it feels like we're herding cats. And in this case, that cat has grown and we're just trying to pick out some outfits for him to wear. So first we've got Kathy and then Cynthia. Kathy, do you have a moment? Thank you, Darren. I'm going to share my screen. Is that the right, is that the right slide coming up? Yep. Thanks, Darren, very much. And hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, familiar issues that you can see on the screen. Let's face it, there are very few perfect wines. And the majority of wines have issues that need fixing, whether it's during the aging, cellaring phase, or as in most cases, just before bottling. Granted, most wines only need a small tweak, although I have had the experience where, oh, there was so much help that was needed. Either way, considering the use of tannin and or oak to get the wines to the perceived perfect level are good options for those that don't have the luxury of aging in barrels or indeed the time before bottling. Using a South African expression, ya, yeah, but, I already have enough tannin in my wine. Why should I be adding more? Most wines do have enough tannin unless you are making wines from American hybrids, which I'm sure many winemakers will be able to vouch for the fact that adding about a thousand parts per million of tannin sometimes is not enough. These though are exceptions. Generally, when we're talking about adding tannins to grapes made from, uh, to wines made from vinifera grapes, we're talking anything between the five to 500 part per million range. Um, 500 is on the high end. Tannins are part of the phenolic matrix of the wine and as such undergo a huge amount of chemical reactions during the wine's life. Tannins bind with polysaccharides, anthocyanins and each other impacting mouthfeel, structure, palatability, 
and aromatics. The addition of tannins can change the structure by polymerizing, thereby creating these huge molecules that eventually precipitate out, changing the nature of the tannin. They can bind with compounds that could release aromas and also have been known to bind with proteins, thus affecting the stability of the wine. And this brings me to probably the most important point of the whole idea of making any additions at any time to any wine. No wine is the same. You will hear this a lot today. Each wine has its own matrix and will react differently to any addition of any product. And it can be very difficult. And as a result, it is difficult to predict what the outcome and impact will be, which is why bench trials are imperative. I can feel the tsunami wave of eye rolling and sighs coming through the atmosphere when the words bench trials are mentioned. I know I'm one of them. I think there are three groups. The first group are the lab interns and enologists whose job it is to set up trials. They try every combination and they give the winemaker every opportunity to find the right piece to make the wine perfect. They do it with gusto, they do it with pleasure, and they do a wonderful job. I think the second group are people who are super curious and super organized and have made or make the time to get it right. They will try every combination because they can and because they can see the finish line. And then, myself included, there's the rest of us who either hate doing bench trials, don't know how to do bench trials, or have no time to do them because you are doing everything from driving the forklift to fixing the filter, to ordering supplies, to running the tasting room, and the list goes on and on. Bench trials are time consuming, but once you get the hang of it, it is pretty easy and so worth it. I worked with a winemaker who once said that winemakers make 2000 decisions from harvest to bottling. Each decision made under the premise that you are making the best wine you possibly can. Bench trials are another tool to help with that goal. Just a few more important decisions to go. Tools of the trade. Most of us these days because of COVID are probably um, stuck at home. Um, this is my bench trial setup in our kitchen. Um, you don't need much. Um, notebooks very important. And then you have the Scott Labs finishing kit. And if you look at page 110 of our Scott Labs handbook, there is a, um, a whole page on bench trial protocols and also the tools that you need. If you look at the finishing kit, we have 11 tannins in there. Um, it's less than some other vendors that offer and more than others. 11 might seem a little overwhelming, but once you get the hang of it, it's really not that bad. Also included in the this, in this kit is Regulus, which is a product that if you have any um, wines that maybe need some sulfide, uh, have some sulfide issues to treat beforehand, we've got gum arabic and another protein, and a mana protein, which is another potential aid to fix some mouthfeel problems. So how do you actually go about doing a bench trial? Um, I'll give you an example. The last couple of days, I've been working with some 2020 Sauvignon Blancs. Um, I set up eight glasses put 50 mils in each glass. The reason that um, the winemaker asked me to work on the wines was because um, it was from a warmer area. It had some good tropical um, uh, notes, but it really wasn't terribly Sauvignon Blanc-like. Also um, on the palate, it, it was a little bit unbalanced. So I got my eight glasses with my 50 mils in, and then using the micro pipette, I added 10 grams per hectoliter of a different tannin to each glass. Um, I suggest starting with 10 grams per hectoliter, which is 100 parts per million. This will give you a very good idea as to how the tannin is going to impact the wine. Um, go through, taste, and then see. Um, and then check out the ones that either make the control, that are either worse than the control or don't do anything for you. Keep the ones that do, and then you start dialing it in. You start looking at different dosage levels, and then you also start looking at possible blending. Um, in this particular case, I found that using FT Blanc happened to lift the palate, kind of gave it that nice um, zesty that which the winemaker was looking for, but it didn't do anything for the aromatics, whereas FT Blanc Citrus, on the other hand, 
did seem to bring out the, the aromatics and kind of pushed it a little bit more to that racy Sauvignon Blanc si uh, style. Um, short story long, after um, about an hour, I managed to come up with a blend, um, which was um, five grams per hectoliter of uh, FD Blanc um, citrus for the aromatics, and then 10 grams per hectoliter of FD Blanc for the palate. Um, another huge benefit of doing bench trials, which most people don't really think about, is that for adding any products, you can see how the products behave during the preparation, the rehydration, and the mixing. Sometimes there are solubility issues, and doing bench trials will alert you, the winemaker, to the potential issues when scaling up in the cellar and can help formulate an efficient plan. So this begs the question then, what tannins to use and when? As Darren mentioned in the introduction, we're looking at natural solutions for fixing wine issues, and our tannins definitely fall into that category. Our Scott Labs range of tannins are all naturally sourced from varying tree and nut sources. They're extracted, processed, and blended according to strict IOV guideline, OIV guidelines by the IOC, which are suppliers from the Champagne region of France, who are one of the oldest and most trusted producers for tannins and fining agents. Being able to fingerprint the different tannin types enables us to maintain consistency and quality control over our products. You can see here using chromatograph, you've got the different um, signals. On the left, you've got Caracho, and then on the right, you've got some um, peaks, uh, which would show that it's oak or chestnut tree. Why do we need to be able to fingerprint the tannins? Well, you know, winemakers have many problems. Uh, well, a lot of issues such as color instability, structural def deficiencies and aromatic problems generally dictate what tannin products will be formulated to meet the winemaker's demands. Um, using this thin layer chromatography, we can make sure that our tannins are consistent with the intended usage. And below you can see um, the fingerprint of fermentation tannin. Um, you can see that there's grapeseed extract in it, um, which is very good for uh, helping fix color, also for structure. And then Caracho. Caracho is a, a tree that is usually found in Argentina, South American hardwood tree, um, and is known uh, as a condensed tannin to be very good at helping to um, keep color stable or to help fix color during the fermentation process. So timing of the tannin additions depends on your needs and your goals. Um, fermentation tannins added at the beginning of fermentation generally consist of condensed tannins which will help with um, color stabilization. You've got elagic and gallic tannins in there for antioxidative purposes. And um, fermentation tannins is probably a webinar all on its own. For our purposes though, today we're looking at the cellaring and the aging tannins. By adding a multi-dimensional tannin, you can help reduce harshness. You can build structure over time. Um, by adding some of the um, oak tannins that have been toasted, you can get um, some of the characters such as vanilla, coffee, chocolate, caramel, especially if you're aging in neutral barrels or in stainless steel tanks. Um, an important point to realize about using these cellaring and aging tannins, you could actually start using them now, for instance, if you have 2020 wines that you want to start working on using small bits to actually um, start building your structure. But if you are getting down to the wire, the minimum contact time of adding these tannins should be three to six weeks before bottling. Three weeks is the absolute minimum. Six weeks is preferable. Um, most of the reason for this is because it could gum up your filter um, before bottling if you add it later than that. And then finally, um, if you really are under the wire and um, you do only have days before bottling, we do have some uh, finishing tannins, which you can actually add up to 48 hours before bottling and they won't gum up your filter. These tannins are highly soluble. Um, generally, you only need to use them in small doses uh, because um, in this case, um, a small amount goes a long way. So um, it does limit your options in order to get yourself over the finishing line, but the options are there if they need it. This is a very brief overview um, of possible solutions to potential issues. Um, I look forward to diving into some of the specifics during the question and answer session um, afterwards. And right now I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Cynthia, 
who uh, will be able to give, discuss all the OPE options for you. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, we've got, we've got some questions already um, and uh, we'll be hitting them up after uh, Cynthia's talk, but yeah, thank you, Kathy. All right, um, now I just gotta figure out how I stop sharing. Um, oops. Sorry, sorry. Um. <laughs> Can you start, just start you, to share, yeah. There you I go. think I got there it, you go. I got it, yeah. Kathy, you're yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. That was great. I, I swear I've been around Kathy for about a year now at Scott Laboratories. And every time I talk to her, I, I learn something new. So uh, it's great. I've always been an oak girl and I'm learning a lot about tannins. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today uh, from the oak side, but I do want to make sure that we kind of close out that issue that uh, Kathy started with, which is, um, you know, do I use oak or do I use tannins? That is a question that comes into us. So um, I wanted to make sure that we start today's conversation and I want to confirm, Darren, you can see my screen appropriately, correct? That is correct. Yes. Okay. Scott Labs, um, or customers wish to know, yep. Yes, so we have two big questions that come in um, to our, both to the call center and to Kathy and myself. And, you know, you got to remember we, at Scott Laboratories, we have a very broad spectrum of clients. So we have a lot of um, home winemakers, small scale winemakers, there's co-ops amongst them. We have mid and large size wineries, and then we have the corporate winery. So we get sort of varying degrees of technical questions that come in, but every once in a while you can start to see a thread of a question, a common question that's coming through. Sometimes that's vintage oriented, and sometimes you can tell something's going on in the industry or there's a question in the industry or a need in the industry that's requiring a solution. So in terms of oak and tannin, there's two big questions that come in. The first is, should I use oak or should I use tannins? So Kathy's walked you through the tannins that we have to offer to you, but we do often get that question. Uh, you know, sometimes I use oak, I've always used barrels. How do I know, or why would I use um, tannins? And I apologize if you can hear it in the background, but this is a webinar from home and I, my dog chose to bark at this point in time. <laughs> Clearly he has a choice of oak or tannin and he's telling us. Um, so we have some quantifying questions that come in behind that. And it's usually, how do I make that decision? So how do I choose it? Is one option better than the other? Why? And when should I add them? Um, and is it a difficult addition to make? Is one option better than the other is something we'll address later. Are they interchangeable? No. There are times where both products will work similarly, but they're not interchangeable. Um, there are times, again, where maybe at fermentation, you might be able to swap one for the other, but they really do different things ultimately in the end. Is it a difficult addition to make to wine? Absolutely not. It's probably one of the easiest additions to, that you'll make to wine. So we won't talk about that much um, later on in the presentation. And then from the oak side, it is more often than not, certainly for the last 20 years, but much more frequently in the last five years, due to cost, usually somebody, a CFO tapping you on the shoulder saying, you had 6,000 barrels last year, you're going down to 3,000 and 1,000 in three years. I need to rotate out of barrels. I need to move off into alternatives. I've only ever used barrels. I don't know what to do. Can you help me practically? Can you help me get through that step? Uh, the number one question that comes in behind that, and this is a million dollar question, which is how do I replicate what barrels bring to my wine? It's a hard question to answer, but I will tell you that having been around this for a long time, again, I think we started in the mid to late nineties with alternatives. Um, Many winemakers, once they start down that road of getting into alternatives, actually start to prefer alternatives. There may always be use for barrels. I would never tell you not to buy a barrel. This girl loves herself a barrel. But the level of consistency that you get with oak alternatives and the level of precise winemaking you, you can use that in is very, very beneficial to winemaking. So um, don't, don't worry about necessarily replicating exactly those flavors. You're probably gonna get very close to it and you may actually ultimately wind up preferring what you're doing with alternatives. Is it truly that much more cost-effective? Absolutely, not a question. Whether even if you're depreciating your barrels, it is much more cost-effective to use oak alternatives and tannins, even if you only use the oak alternatives once. How do I introduce them to my winemakers? So let's say you're a, an associate winemaker or you're an enologist and you have the project that lands on your lap to guess what, we're moving away from barrels and I need you to get the winemaking team on board. I feel your pain, we will talk about that later. I've lived through that as well. It is not the easiest task, but A, oak altern the alternative products on the market today are vastly superior to what they used to be and um, B, there's ways to make that happen. 
How do I add inserts to barrels or staves to tanks? Again, we have a broad spectrum of clients, so we really do get some of these questions, and that's why this discussion will become a very practical discussion about oak, not necessarily a uh, detailed technical discussion about oak. It's really about how you make this change at your winery. How long before battling should I add oak? Um, I'll address it this at the very end, as I will with tannins. Both of these questions come around, again, three to six weeks for the finishing tannins, smaller or less, shorter time span for the soluble tannins, highly soluble tannins, but we can talk about that at the end. And then do I really need to do a bench trial? Can't you just decide? We literally have had people say, can you just tell me which color profile to use? I can make a recommendation, but I'm going to send you a kit as well because absolutely positively, you are going to want to taste them. I liken this to cooking, you know, you've been cooking steak for your family for years and you've been using salt. So maybe you varied it up with salt, regular salt one day, kosher salt a different day, Himalayan salt the next day. That's you've you've been working with. And somebody brings you pepper and says, try this, it works really well on steak. That's oak, right? And to some degree it's tannin, a little less, but oak will have a big impact on your wine. How much impact depends on how much oak you use, the type of oak you use and your wine matrix but it is going to change things. So you do need to taste it. We always recommend that you taste it. So with these two big questions in mind, um, and from a practical standpoint, we're gonna try to close out the issue of tannins. Now you know about tannins. Now the question is, how do we make that decision between the two? So oak or tannins. Kathy and I put together a little grid to, um, to help identify what are the similarities and what are the differences. Now the similarities are pretty, pretty obvious, probably based on the fact that these are wood derivatives in general. Um, oak and tannin will both of these people, both of these products will give you um, structure. They'll help add structure to your wine. They're going to affect the mouthfeel of your wine, and they're going to help stabilize color. They can be used at fermentation, during cellaring and aging, and also as a finishing. Now, the only caveat with oak is we would never recommend that you use untoasted oak as a finishing tool because it is much too harsh on the wine. Now, if you're outside of the wine industry and another alcoholic beverage industry, be it mead, cider, or anything else, that, that story, that game is still open. Um, and we do have untoasted chips from France. We are more than happy to talk to you about. Um, it's something, it works a little bit differently in different industries with the different alcohol levels. So um, don't discount it. And both infusion products and uh, tannins are, are much less expensive than oak barrels. Now, where they're different is what's going to make help you make that decision of which one you can use. From the oak perspective, oak brings a very broad impact on wine. So it is going to affect your wine almost, almost A to Z, right? You, you usually get some impact on your aroma. You're definitely gonna get an impact on the structure of that wine and you will find some oak in the finish, usually depending on the oak you use. The beauty with that, however, is even for novice drinkers, most people can recognize oak in wine and it is always perceived as quality. So when you're faced with that, I need to craft a very drinkable wine. I need to make sure that my consumer will like this wine. There's a vast amount of styles on the market. Oak is one of those things that's almost always a selling tool as long as you don't over oak and make it too, too, um, um, too harsh for the client. Um, it's gonna be perceived as quality and it's usually what helps you sell a wine. However, tannins, and this is where they differ, and I apologize, but I'm a visual person, and I always see a dial when I see the word tannins, because tannins are, this is their power, really. They're so incredibly precise. You can say, you know what, I, I and we actually have regions in the country where the growing season is great, the fermentation went through fine, no issues, very sound wine, love my wine, can't get my mid palate right, I just, I just have a hole in the middle. That's where a tannin comes in. Tannins are really powerful that way because they'll let you, you, you know, again, you need to go through your bench trial to see which one is working for you, but it will help you fill in the gaps of your wine without massively altering the rest of your wine. So that's really ultimately what helps you make that decision is how much time do you have? How much impact do you wanna have on your wine? So that should help you make that decision about oak and tannin. So let's say, okay, now I know the answer. I have enough time for oak. I, what next, right? I know I need to move out of barrels, I'm a little bit resistant. What do I need to do? And again, this is a practical discussion because we get a lot of questions of literally how do I put the insert into a barrel? Or I don't exactly know what to do with my tank with these, with these, or, or where do I where do I take these alternatives once I'm done with them? There are very practical needs that need to be addressed when you're making the shift from barrels to alternatives. Um, first, I would recommend that if there's a pathway 
you have barrels on site, you're more than likely, it's a four or five year um, life cycle for that barrel. You may be depreciating the barrels, you're not going to get rid of them, full stop. Step into the water, dip your toe into the water by using barrel inserts. Barrel inserts are also called bung sleeves. That's an interchangeable word. It allows you to continue using your asset, but also to start seeing what the oak alternative, what the alternative, I apologize, I keep saying oak alternative and that's a, um, you know, a dated term, what the alternative world will give you. Um, you're gonna get a bump of new oak and you're going to learn what that new oak looks like for your wines. And it allows you to do it while you're using your barrels and while you're kind of cycling out of that life cycle of the, of the barrel. In the meantime, you need to be thinking about your winery because you're now not having this barrel shea where you're putting wine into barrels where you have labor for barrels, where you have barrel racks and you have the cost of a barrel shea. You're now going to use your stainless steel cellar to introduce oak into the vats, right? So you need to think about how am I going to put that oak into my, into my tanks? If you're very small scale, you do not want to make much investment. There are ways where you could just drop loose bags of cubes or segments, or you can stack loose staves at the bottom of the tank. It's not my recommendation. Never doing it, never do it during fermentation because oak will rise, right? Until it absorbs the, the uh, wine, it won't fall to the bottom. You risk damaging um, the inside of anything in your tank. Um, obviously, you're gonna have some issues if you're doing any pump overs, and you certainly don't want to damage any probes. So my recommendation always is to insert D rings or C rings into your tanks. Um, you can weight these down. I've seen a lot of people actually just take uh, literally just stainless steel clamps from the cellar, uh, grasp it around the bag and just um, use that to weight down the bag. So in a pinch, could you do it? Yes. Is it recommended? No. And it's definitely not recommended if you are looking to move out of barrels into alternatives in anything more than five to five to 10% of your winemaking. You really need to think about prepping your cellar. Um, considerations with D-rings, most people put these in around six feet above the bottom of the uh, tank, and that's because you're going to have a human being going into that tank. Um, again, be cognizant of anything that's inside that tank in terms of probes or equipment so that you are sure that your, um, again, when the staves go in, even if they're uh, uh, hung on rings, they're going to float for a while. But you're also going to have a human being stepping into that tank, so make sure you're thinking about how they can proceed. Now, uh, again, six feet is usually okay. I'd probably stumble on it because I'm short, but most people can handle it. They're going to go ahead and hang that in. Now, please be cognizant of the fact that, and this is um, something that we've learned over the years, which is why producers of, of alternatives usually have downsized the weight of their um, products for you. That is because of thinking of the health and safety of your seller person. It goes in at 15 pounds as a fan pack, comes out as 30 goes in as 20 pounds as a, a bag of our cubes, comes out as 40. It's essentially a one-to-one -one ratio of weight. So when they're taking that out, when you're done with that, um, they're taking 40 pounds above their head on a slippery surface. Uh, it's been done in the industry for a very long time. It's certainly safe. Just be cognizant of the fact that as you're rotating out of barrels and building this process in your cellar, that you wanna think about everybody in the team that's impacted by what they're doing. Usage and removal, these are set and designed for one-term use. I've seen many people use them more than one time. We do sell an oak restorer product. It's geared more, it was developed in the Australian market for the Australian market, but it's geared more toward bar towards barrels and towards staves. It's a lot more difficult to rinse dry um, cubes because of the format within the mesh bag, but um, it's certainly there and it's an option for you. I've also seen many people do it in different fashions. That is a winemaking decision, a winery process decision. We don't have a protocol for that, but I'm certainly happy to take a phone call and tell you what I know just anecdotally from my experience in the industry around that. So if you're really pinched financially, you can certainly use these twice. Um, again, if there's questions around that, um, give us a call. Um, it, more than likely they're gonna afford you to me just because of my experience, but I would say start as you wish to proceed. If you know you need to go down the road financially of making this adjustment, Tiptoe into it by using your barrel inserts, but definitely think about planning for your seller in the future. Keep it simple. It's not like you're gonna to have to go shopping for a whole new set of suppliers. If you've been using barrels and you have major barrel suppliers, they already have a line of alternatives. Go ahead and taste those alternatives. They may work for you. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. These have been around for over 20 years. Many of us in the industry and many of your neighbors probably down the road from you who are winemakers are likely already using them, reach out. This is a good thing about the wine industry is we help each other. Okay, so now we say, now I've done it. I know I'm gonna use alternatives. I know what I'm doing in my cellar. 
which alternative product do I use? Of course, we're going to say use Thermic because it is our product and we do not, we're not here for a pitch sales or anything, but um, we do believe in our product and there's a reason why we brought this product into, uh, into Scott Laboratories. So again, if you're starting, use, you know, certainly taste the alternative um, of the barrel suppliers that you're already using, but please consider using Thermic. We're gonna give you a free kit anyway, if you ask for it. So you would definitely be able to taste it, but there's a reason for it. Um, this is a very unique product. We use Quercus alba. So this is a white American oak that we're getting from Pennsylvania because we believe this oak, this Pennsylvania white oak is the best oak on the market. And the process we use is different getting it to the oven and the oven we use is different, right? So it's re the result is an incredibly consistent product and we believe it is the most consistent product on the market. That's why we are offering it because what we heard in the industry and I certainly did over the last 20 years is uh, winemakers were very happy as they started rotating out of barrels. There was that sort of un uncomfortable zone. And then it became, wow, alternatives are actually very consistent. And then it was sort of like, oh, about two and a half, three months into it, still starting to taste sort of a character I'm not liking. It's not quite as consistent as, as quite as consistent as I, as I would like it to be. So, you know, like you like chocolate and all of a sudden you like chocolate and you like better chocolate and better chocolate. That's absolutely where we are in this industry. And Scott Laboratories has found this, um, great American oak, this incredibly cool oven, and I could do a seminar on the oven, it's, uh, oven itself. So call me if you want more information, but we have a thermal modification unit and there are only a handful of these in the United States, so they're hard to find. Um, and it took time to develop profiles, but it's a very cool thermal modification oven that is smoke-free and it's combustion-free. And what that means for you is we can put our uh, material into this oven and go for lower temperatures for much longer periods of time. And we can also go higher temperatures than is normally found in, in traditional convection ovens. And literally, we don't want to do this with our product, but literally we could put a charge, or several skids of material into that oven, close it for the weekend and come back on Monday morning with no risk of ignition or explosion. That's what makes it different as well. It's really, really cool. It's very exciting. I could geek out forever about it, but we don't have time for that today. But what we've done is, you know, again, you have a larger, we now have a larger array to offer you of um, options, but it's easier to start by keeping it simple. So we've created the range where we've got a light toast and a heavy toast and some in between. So we have color profiles one through five, we've kept it simple, colors one through five, left to right, light to dark. That allows you, they're incredibly distinct and they're incredibly clean. And that's one of the reasons I'm at Scott Laboratories was A, the reputation of Scott Laboratories is fantastic. And B, I tasted these for the first time and went, they're so clean. They're so clean. They're so clean. They're so clean. What a fantastic product. If I had these 20 years ago, my conversations with winemaking would have been so much easier. Uh, and they're really, truly distinct. And I could say, I actually literally pushed glasses forward in front of me and said, this is this brand profile. That's that brand profile. And literally we see winemakers ordering that for those brands. It's actually very clear. It's that simple, which is fantastic. Um, clearly, cost-effective, it's a great quality product. And behind all of that, you have the Scott Labs promise, which is we're not here to sell you something just for you to have it. It doesn't do you any good and it doesn't do us any good if you're not happy with it. You entered this market for a reason because there's something different. Thermic offers something different that we are not seeing in other products. So it's certainly worth trying. It may or not, may or not work for you. This is wood, it's hedonic. You're either gonna like it or not, but if you're going to move into the world of alternatives, absolutely. Mm -hmm take a trial kit. So with that, you're gonna do a bench trial, right? Because you do wanna taste it. This is our bench trial process, which is a little bit shorter than many of the others out there. It's a 10 day bench trial process. We're gonna send you a kit with five sticks, colors one through five and an instruction card. And there's little peel off stickers for each of those sticks. So you get, uh, you have, you go out to your cellar, you get your six, seven, 15 mil bottles, bring them back inside, mark your first one control. And you put you open up your sticks, put them down into the bottle, and peel off that sticker, put it on your bottle. Ten days later, come back and taste it. That is a 100% barrel impact. So if you like it, and say you love Thermic too, works for you, perfect. Call us and say I like it at 100% barrel impact. I'm treating this many gallons, and we'll send that to you. Most winemakers like to blend, so. If you're doing it, as you saw in Kathy's uh, presentation, make sure you have your notebook with you because you might be tasting multiple suppliers. You need to take your notes. If you're blending back 25% control, 75% thermic three, that tells us you want a 75% barrel impact and we can work with that, right? So again, we will tailor 
what you buy based on what you need. And uh, you might have three or four different, uh, just tell us what your, what your ratio is. We will work out that for you. And then you can just go ahead and purchase the product. And usually it's about a two week turnaround time, no more than that. So um, if you find that it's not enough impact, call me directly. That's a little bit harder to figure out, but um, and that our emails will be at the end of this presentation as well. But call us and we'll, we'll help you uh, figure out if you want 125 or 150%. Sometimes you really need that. Sometimes you're, you're, you're kind of going heavy on the oak because you're masking something or just because you're filling something. Now, if you are, we do have some clients that are very repeat buyers. They're very grounded in thermic. Um, I'm trying to move to a process to help them, especially with international imports where you don't have a lot of wine to work with and you have very little time to work with where I'm um, an oak geek. So I have a saw at home. I will cut smaller samples for you. Um, you can use them in your typical four ounce jars, 48 hours later, taste it. It won't be 100% impact, but it's gonna tell you the direction that Thermic's gonna go. And the beauty of Thermic, apart from it being incredibly consistent, um, we had a newsletter that went back out in April where one of our winemakers said, you know, the, the, the best thing for him was it scales from bench trial to production. That's really, really important. And that's what's allowing us to have these sort of high impact mini stays for those people that know what they're looking for because they know they can trust it to get to uh, the production level without an issue. So that's our bench trial process. Now the question is, how do we get you over the crossing line? How do we get you over that finishing line, right? How do we get you to bottling? Well, if your bottling date, uh, Kathy and I worked on sort of a six week rolling calendar. If your bottling date is at the bottom, right? So you're at the end of the month, you need to make sure that you've worked backwards for in general, 30 day contact time with oak. That is the minimum we would recommend if you want full impact. High extraction is a different conversation. Um, if you're pressed for time, you may have to pull things off early, but in general, we would recommend no less than 30 days. Make sure you back on top of that, you got to tack on the time for the 10 day trial, right? And in between there, you'll have made your decision on what product you wish to order and you need to order it, have, have, ship it, receive it, and actually have it installed in your cellar. So you're going to need to back yourself up to another about 45 days. Um, even better 60 if you have it, right? So, and it's about the same with our finishing tannins. Again, it's three, six weeks for those um, finishing tannins, um, but you have an ACE in your pocket. So if you get pushed or if marketing says, guess what, it's coming three months earlier, following now in March instead of May, um, you have those highly soluble tannins, which we used to call our Lux tannins, which you can add 48 hours or less to kind of get you across that finishing line and get the best wine into that bottle before, um, before you're putting it on market. So these were the reasons why we did the today's seminar is basically we know that this occurs. We know that people are moving to alternatives. We know that people have to bottling dates move all the time. So don't discount using those Lux tan, those highly soluble tannins because they will be your ace in the pocket and make sure that you're bench testing and planning now for your future needs for oak. Um, and with that, I'm hoping that between Kathy's awesome seminar and our talk on Oak today that you've got lots of questions and I'll hand it back to Darren. Great. That was super sweet. Thank you very much. Yeah, we do actually have a fair amount of questions. Um, and I'm just going to get right into it because I don't want to spend too much time um, wasting your, your guys' valuable, valuable time. But thank you both very much. Um, really quick, I'm going to start with the, just a general question for Kathy if you want to unmute. Uh, what do you think about using finishing stuff? We talked about this before, but like um, bulk wine samples or like, uh, you know, being able to take some bulk wine samples, maybe even if even if you're selling bulk wine or even from the worldwide market, what do you what's your what's your advice or any techniques or 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 comments about that? So um I have done some uh, some testing, some some tannin dosing in uh, in Chile, um, South Africa, and Australia. Um, one of the questions that specifically done in Chile was that people had wine sitting in their tanks, um, and they were waiting for the Marks and Spencer rep, or the Tesco's rep, or the Waitrose rep to come by looking for a specific wine. Um, some of them had been sitting in the tanks for a while, so we did some trials dosing just to see if we could freshen things up, you know, elevate some things. So. Um, that was, and they had a couple of months before the reps came by. So they were starting to work on the wines then. So yes, um, doing tannins uh, on bulk wine is a, is a, is a very good option. Um, and then, you know, also I've just been working on the Sauvignon Blanc that I was working on. It is also a bulk wine um, and they're looking for it to, to see if they could elevate 
you know, and do what I did to it so that when a broker comes around, um, they have a wine ready to go. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate your conversation too. I mean, the, the, the presentation, because, you know, honestly, when we do, we can delve really deeply into these processes, at least what we can understand, but there's so many things we kind of, you know, us as a, as a scientific, you know, a group out here in, in, in winemaking or beverage making, there's a lot of stuff we just don't know. But so the real takeaway I hear again and again and again and again and again and again and again is to just do the trials. Mm -hmm. And I think, honestly, when you look back at that calendar, if you don't mind putting that calendar back up, Cynthia, for just a second, I think that's something good to leave up um, just because we can kind of get an idea. We had some questions in the Q&A about timing, uh, which we can't stress enough. But I'm going to go ahead and allow Jillian. Um, she put her hand up during the talk, and it's our um, we got a call in. So, Jillian, if you don't mind um, asking your question um, when you get a chance. Jillian, are you still there? All right, uh, we'll get back to you when we, um, uh, oh, here you are, Jillian. Hello. Hey, yeah. yes. Thanks for calling in. No, I, I did not have a question, sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for raising your hand. <laughs> okay, well then let's hit, hit it up in the Q&A stuff. Um, what about filtration and timing of tannin addition? So um, I know I've had my experience with dealing with certain tannins and turns out they weren't actually super dissolvable. So do you, Kathy, do you see, you know, it, when you talk to clients about um, timing and, and let's say I want to do a tweak, I realize I taste my wine, bottling date, it's coming up, it's two or three weeks from now, for instance. Uh, what do you talk to them about finding or tannin addition and filtration? I mean, what, what, is, what should be aware of it? Is there some tannins you wouldn't do right now or is there some tannins you would just start them with? So um, the first question you ask is when is the actual bottling date and is it a hard and fast bottling date? Um, you know, I, again, with the Sauvignon Blanc, um, found a, a solution for, um, I, this is a different one, they were bottling in two weeks. And the solution that we found, the tannin that we found is actually one of the ones that should be added you know, three to six weeks before bottling. So that's kind of that slippery slope. The reason that we do have these minimum um, contact times is because the, the wine needs, to, uh, the, the tannins need to integrate, they need to get into solution. Some of the tannins will have some insoluble um, properties to them. And so they need time for it to integrate, to precipitate out so that it won't gum up the filtration. So that's, that's really the reason. Um, the winemaker can try if they've got two weeks and they have three weeks and it's a three week contact time, um, depending on the tannin, there are some that are more soluble than others. And that might be, but um, the, the real reason for the timing is, is filtration. Okay. Okay, good. Um, okay. Then when we're going to go ahead and do these Q and A's, they're going to kind of bounce around because I don't have, they don't, they don't come in organized. So um, I'm going to start with this question, which I think is to Cynthia. If minimum contact time is three to six weeks, does that mean then oak bench trials should be resting for six weeks before tasting? No, the bench trial is, um, so it's set up to the amount of the volume of, of wood that we're putting in a 750 mil uh, bottle for you is actually going to be equivalent uh, of a 100% barrel impact. So when you just call us and tell us what barrel impact you're looking for, how long you have, that will decide how much oak you need to put in contact with that wine. So when you're tasting that bench trial, it is a 10 day bench trial. So our experience is through, you know, usually through sensory behind this. Most people will, will, will admit to that is you can do analytics, but uh, matrix is change on wine. So you're looking sensorily at 10 days. Is this what I'm getting at as an equivalent um, uh, production scale, 30 day impact? And that's what we've geared it to. So the bench trial is 10 days. But okay. when you're going, when you're scaling up, that is a 30 day contact time. You know, you can, so, there are people who do, there are people who will double up on oak and actually yeah. try to impact a little bit faster. The only thing is, you know, it, it all depends on how time extraction rate is also something that's not a perfect, well, I'm sure it's a perfect science. None of us perfectly understand it yet, but you are going to get different things coming out of that wood in the beginning. So if you double up oak and you have 15 days on it and you're trying to get that, that impact, you're going to get an impact on what's coming on the outside of that oak, right? So you're, you're normally getting your most toasted impact, right? 
with thermic, it's pretty, it, it's an even consistent toe. So you're going to get a little bit, we feel a little bit better extraction and a little bit a more uh, generalized extraction, but you will not get what was intended to be the 100% barrel impact. But there are many people who do do it because they're actually looking just for the bumps of vanillin and they're just for the bumps of furfural. So they will do yeah. high extract, high dosage, shorter time. That is a- Yeah, so, the t but the 10 days to cold soak is, I mean, the, 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 there's a very much assurance that- Yep. Okay, yeah, cold, okay, yeah. Because Whether the, you do 30, 60, 90 day for your, for your impact, yeah. it's meant to be 100% barrel impact. That's an equivalent. Yeah. And that is also something that is, you know, it's winemaker dependent. So we have to, it's really great to have conversations. That's why you do the tastings. Yeah, and then the, the next question, uh, you know, kind of addressing the elephant in the room a little bit. What is your, what is your guys' experience with, um, with masking or counterbalancing against smoke um, components? Is there any, anything you've seen so far that's particularly, that could be particularly helpful for anyone? I mean, from the tannin side, maybe from the oak side? You can take this one, Cynthia. Okay. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> We're all like, there's no silver bullet. Punt it to the other. <laughs> um, <laughs> there is no silver bullet. Okay. I, and that's why there are different, differing theories around this, right? Because nobody knows. There's no perfect answer. The smoke is different. The wines are different, right? How long it's been exposed to smoke, what kind of smoke it was expo exposed to. Um, with thermic, I can only speak anecdotally to what we have, uh, what we have witnessed in house with this product. Um, Thermic, this is where it actually gets incredibly interesting. Um, most people, okay, thermic is one through five, light to dark, uh, very standard kind of approach to talking about oak. Um, most people gravitate to thermic two, three, and four, and it's hard to tell if that's just the natural human reaction to gravitate towards the middle of the scale or to have a preference for that because it, it, it gets right around that medium to medium plus toast barrel profile, which is frequently used across the industry. One in five, and I know people are going to just be like, what did you say? One in five seem to have some strange reparative quality. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a stylistic issue, but I found it on VA affected wines and we found it on smoke taint wines. With Thermic One, and one of the hardest ones to deal with with smoke taint for me is Pinot, because Pinot's already a difficult, um, there's, some, there's some delicateness you need to approach uh, oak with, with Pinot. And on more than one occasion, it's it's brought back the aromatics to make a heavily smoke tainted Pinot smell like Pinot again, which was very weird when none of the others really did that, but five took away the ashtray smoky taste at the end. So the, the blend of the two is actually what was working. Two, three, and four really did nothing for it. Now, yeah. two, three, and four work around most wines, whether they're hybrid wines or viniferous wines, that's usually where you find people is using two, three, and four. Same thing happened with VA. There's sort of a, a work of the scale that works. Now we did it on rose taint and it was all over the board. So it probably depends on um, the wine you're dealing with, the level of smoke taint you have. But all I would say is I know that people are out there saying, you know, do very low levels of toast. Don't, you know, you don't want to add too much glycol on glycol. That's not actually what I've seen. So yeah, it depends on the wine. Yeah. Get your bench trials, get your bench trials, get, get oak on it to taste. And then of course, when it's glycosylated or not, we can't, we can't tell you what's going to happen five years from now. No yeah. one knows that. And it isn't a silver bullet either way. None of us can guarantee how long it will last. You know, but it is a very strange phenomenon to see one in five kind of just shine in these reparative ways. Yeah. And we, you know, we, ha we had this comment this morning, too, um, from a different t a conversation about tannin and smoke and that Royal specifically mm -hmm. was mentioned as a way to uh, counterbalance potentially. This might be after remediation. This might be after some other process. But there's some tannins out there that are looking in to um, helping at least with some pullment. Now, of course, with a big disclaimer, we're not entirely sure about the, the mechanism of these things. But that being said, um, Royal might be a one. Is there any other one, Ta Cannon, Ta uh, Kathy, off the top of your head, that tannin might just be so aromatic that you might potentially say to try for smoke-affected fruit or wine? Well, we do, we do have a couple of, um, you know, if you want to sort of drown out <laughs> some of the, um, we do have a couple of tannins that, are, that really give you that slug of, um, whether it's oak or um, vanilla, those kinds of characters. Um, we call them the over-the-top tannins. Um, they're mm -hmm. available on the website, the bold and the finesse. And those would be the ones that if you're looking to drown out, um, you know, some of that, that potential to the smoke taint or the, the masking effect um, would be. But, but the, 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 the anecdotal evidence of Royal, because Royal has been known to kind of counteract some of the um, effects of Brett and being, yeah. you know, one of those compounds, 
um, it certainly is something that could probably help out. And then, okay, so here we go. So there's a mead question, but I'm gonna go ahead and expand this question to any non-wine question. And that is a mead question or, or non-wine question, even cider. Uh, since neither of them have much uh, tannins when they come out of fermentation, is there any idea of what you guys would recommend for finishing tannins? Or, or And I would even uh, assert uh, fermentation tannins that you might recommend to reach you know, higher levels of tannins. Is there any, any kind of dosage recommendations or anything to do with uh, non-wine beverages for fermentation and such? Again, it's going to be that it depends. <laughs> And doing the bench trials, but um, certainly if you don't have any tannin, you know, which I, I can't speak from um, meat or cider experience, but speaking from the wine side and the American hybrids, um, I know that starting to add um, a fermentation tannin at the beginning of fermentation might help. And then you can, you know, add, um, but I know that um, with some of the American hybrids, they're adding fermentation tannins and then supplementing them with higher loads. So it, again, it's going to have to be that um, starting at a higher dosage level would be what I would recommend. But yeah, maybe so building. Right. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. yeah. So FT Blanc, FT Blanc Citrus. FT right. Blanc soft, uh, FT Rouge, FT Rouge okay. Soft. Yeah. Uh, even maybe also if you're looking more for the um, the natural effects. So with the tans, you know, we've got some um, grape seed and then uh, grape seed and grape tannin, um, a blend or just the grape, uh, the grape um, skin itself. Uh, might okay. be a good one too. Yeah. And you can always add more guys. You know, if you, if right. my, 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 my experience has been is to add fermentation tannins during those kind of beverage production. And then when you find yourself nearing the end or even during aging and you still need a little umph and you think you need, you know, a wine level amount of tannin or, or a higher amount is to slowly build on top of that. Cause you can add more, but you can't take away. When is the fermentation tannin webinar scheduled? Okay, so yeah, we'll do a fermentation tannin uh, webinar, obviously closer to harvest. But uh, this was kind of a basic beginning um, presentation um, webinar for when it comes to tannin and oak to kind of give you an idea to you guys to think about timeline and trials. Subsequent webinars will be dealing, digging more deeply into these topics, potentially, like, like Kathy had said. We could spend two hours on just fermentation tannins and only several ones. So it's really, this one is really kind of the intro. How are the stock solutions included in the finishing kit formulated? Do they provide any advantages with respect to bench trial accuracy versus mixing a stock solution as needed? So the, uh, the, the solutions in the uh, fermentation finishing kit um, are 1% uh, in 1% alcohol. Um, and there really shouldn't be a difference between the two. It's just more for ease of use. Um, having them already made up, being able and included in the fermentation kit is a dosage chart. Um, so it makes it really easy to go through and do the, um, if you would rather make up your own solution, we have the powdered solutions. It's gonna be pretty much apples to apples. Okay. And then there's a question really quick that I think I might answer, which is how do I deal with the lack of micro oxygenation when move away from barrels? I, you know, I'm going to take this from a small side and a, and a medium size folks that I've helped with or consulted for. And that is um, if you're a large winery and you're dealing from barrels to tanks, you would typically buy a micro ox unit. And that micro ox unit comes with uh, recommendations and any kind of system or program you build around that requires a little bit of product development with, with oaks and we thermic would fit nicely into those programs. But if you're going to do a smaller um, conversion from barrel to non uh, barrel oxidation, you're trying to do that. There are a couple alternative containers out there that I run to like plex tanks, which give you a modicum of oxidation, mainly because of the surface area and how it captures oxygen. So there are ways to kind of mimic it. But if you're in a large winery, it typically means you're going to be buying a micro ox unit. I have used untoasted during from untoasted oak during fermentation to help retain color, but I've recently had concerns raised about the stability of the untoasted oak and therefore recommended to use lightly toasted. Is there any comments on that as far as using untoasted uh, during fermentation versus lightly toasted? You know, it really is going to come down to how much impact there's going to be, especially when you're doing it during fermentation. So both from the tan side, um, you know, fermentation, I, I agree with you, Darren, actually using these products early on is usually a good thing. The same thing with oak. Oak is softer during the fermentation and the results are softer. So when you start to um, 
introduce oak to your wines early on. It helps you know, build those wines. And then you can actually just the adjust at the end, which is very, very nice. If you're moving from untoasted to lightly toasted, you're going to have a slight impact on your wine. So that's where it comes down to how much impact you want to have. Now doing it at the fermentation level should not see much of a difference other than you're going to have more oak aroma and or flavor adjustments to the wine, right? It will help color just like untoasted does. It shouldn't see, you shouldn't see any differences in that. You're just going to see that you're going to pick up a little bit more of an oak aroma. So assuming you're using it on wine, you may not see a, a massive um, change if you're using a very lightly toasted um, product. If you're using it on something like cider or meat or something, you're again, you're going to get a, a little yeah. bit goes a long way with those products. So it's a different conversation. Yeah. And, I, and I, honestly, I'll just put my two cents in that. And that is um, after dealing with and supporting untoasted products, there is a significant difference sometimes in the impact. And I do recommend folks using, if they're going to start of using a product um, as untoasted during the fermentation process, it does require as much as you can, some kind of controlled study. Now it doesn't have to be totally scientific, but keep some of the wine or the juice over if possible. If you've got two ton, two one and a half ton picking or fermentation bins, go ahead and put some in some of the other, because I've run into that where I've added kind of almost prophylactically a certain amount of untoasted oak upon a recommendation of a manufacturer. And it really did kind of make it astringent. So um, I do understand that that concern. Do you prep the, uh, the wood, the cubes, the staves before introducing to the wine? Uh, it, it, from, from your standpoint as a, as a buyer, no, everything that we've done is ready for you. So when you receive it at your winery, it's ready to go in. Okay. I hope that's the question. Yeah. Yep. That is the question. Just throw it in the tank once you get it. Um, yep. Somebody made a comment about the best way to dispose of oak after use is to put it in a meat smoker. That is kind of funny. That's a great uh, idea. There actually there are yeah. places, there are a lot of places that actually that literally bottle it up and sell it. So yeah. I make cider. I'd like to add all the benefits available, but don't want to add a ton of oak flavor. What is my best option? We kind of talked about this before, you know, yeah. if you're going to be using oak, use the untoasted, unflavored or not unflavored tannin, but um, uh, from a, from a thermic standpoint, like the, from a thermic what? standpoint, um, I personally made cider this year and we liked thermic two on it. So it really depends. You're probably going to stay on the lighter end of the scale. Depends on your cider. Depends on where you're at, how long you leave it on. We also, um, threw a little bit of some shavings of a bourbon barrel onto a different, um, lot of that cider, which was ridiculously impactful too quickly. So like anything bench tested get the kit, trial it. Um, you're probably going to stay in the lighter end of the spectrum and you probably won't have nearly the amount of contact wine that lot, time that you would if it, if it were a wine. And Kathy, but it actually same it thing. adds a lot. It's nice. And Kathy, the same thing, like basically stay away from the onyx, the radiance, the rish, the rish. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I know that FT Blanc and FT Blanc soft are tannins that are being used in cider, um, you know, sort of giving that the, the tannin, but, but not a lot of oak character. So um, maybe Reach extra in small doses. Um, again, down to the dosing. Yeah. Um, is it possible to increase the size of the bung hole? I use oak tube inserts and some are tiny bit larger in circumference. <laughs> Have you seen that? And I haven't seen increasing the bung hole size yeah. or barrel insert. I mean, no, ours yeah. don't require that. No, ours actually, the, the thermic kit comes with a stainless steel eyelet screw. So we don't provide yeah. a bung. You have the bung, you can just screw it in. So it should work for anything. Yeah, and then there was another question about prepping the oak. The thermic doesn't need any special um, prepping, as I understand, but someone did comment that they've seen um, some oak alternatives uh, recommended to be soaked in an SO2 solution, solution, at least to help with the dust. But ours, you don't need to do that, correct? No, you know, uh, we, we, we ship in Mylar packaging as well. So um, where we've done, we've chosen to actually create it. We are on site, obviously, do our QC. Um, yeah. at our at the mill and then it comes to us and so it's going to be settling as it comes out and usually by the time you open that if there's any dust it's actually actually settled upon shipping and yes. you really shouldn't see it you really shouldn't see it i've never never in my 20 years of experience it's never really been a problem okay cool and then before anybody else leaves it's 12 o'clock and i understand it's you know an hour but um i just wanted to update you too we are planning on a fermentation Tannin um, webinars. We are planning other webinars in the future that dial in real deeply into these mechanisms and even bring in some other um, folks to help. But this one definitely I would refer to as a as a good starter for anybody you know thinking about doing alternatives or tannins in finishing or any kind of step at this point during the year. It's a good one to start with. 
how do you request a trial kit? Probably the best thing to do is just email, put the request in the website, scottlabs.com, or call in for the um, um, trial kit. That's probably the best way to go about it. Not a question, just want to say I was incredibly impressed with the thermic oak sample, so that's very nice. Nice. Uh, what types of tannin can I be used to treat volatile sulfur compound issues? Do these tannins remove the VSEs or mask them? Uh, if you've got volatile sulfur compounds, I would suggest using Regulus um, to help get rid of those. Treat the wine first and then um, see what you uh, see after you've treated it. Um, give us a ring at Scott Labs. We can send you the information on that. And then um, you could try using a tannin. I honestly don't know. You know, radiance is something I've heard you know, of, of kind of brightening. I think that's part of the last minute fresh fruit highlights, but I'm, I'm seeing yeah. it now and it did make me think, I did have a client tell me that or more than one client tell me that they thought, you know, maybe with conjunction with, you know, some remediation of the sulfides or sulfur-based compounds. Um, uh, but I've had experience to a certain extent with dealing with pretty nefarious lines, <laughs> to put it mildly. And that, yeah, tannin additions, um, at least for masking or counterbalancing or, you know, freshening the aromas around them, um, along with other remediation did kind of help. But again, it's it's a trial format. I mean, that's right. the big summary for this whole talk is yeah. that we have to just get the trial yeah. set up. Any advice on compacting the sediment level layer that I've noticed forms after addition? Um, maybe you should use maybe using one of the silica gels to help compact it um, mm. at the end. Um, that might be something to think about. You know, could send mm. a sample of that to see. Um, but um, yeah, that, that would be my advice is to, to try one of the, the, the uh, settling agents that we have. Is racking needed after adding tannin? Yes, um, it would be a good, depending on what tannin you've added. Um, if there is some sediment, it would be a good idea racking and then filtering. Gotcha. What, even, but not with the finishing tannins. Not with the no, not with the um, the, the three finishing tannins. Um, you don't necessarily have to rack because they will um, because they will be in solution. There won't be anything to precipitate out, so you'll be able to filter it. Um, but some um, of the other tannins, you might need to you you might need to rack off before filtering. Yes. And and then somebody commented that they uh, with the thermic samples they found that they liked them even more within with twenty to thirty days instead of ten days. What does that mean for impact? Well, if it's in a Percentage. 750 mil, yeah, if it's in a 750 mil bottle, that means that you're actually looking for a much heavier impact than what um, we have dosed as a barrel equivalent. So you'd be looking at ordering probably 150 to 200 percent. Oh, um, gotcha. We do, have people, we do have people that have chased them just to see how it progresses, uh, myself included. Um, but it, it is designed, that stick is designed based on its uh, weight and surface ratio to um, wine volume to be 100 percent barrel impact. So you're just going to yeah. you're just going to want more which is fine. It all depends on what works in your wine. Somebody commented, love the simple bench trial. But yeah, basically your answer is, is yeah, if you liked uh, the 10 the day trial after 20 or 30 days, it sounds like you might like, a, you know, two, 100 oak. Love the sample, simple, uh, the sample bench trial approach for thermic. Do you have something similar for finishing trials? We do, we have the uh, finishing kit from um, Scott Labs. So if you want, if you want to invest the time and the money into doing that, I, what my recommendation is and generally for tannin trials um, is to, uh, and Kathy and I talked about this before, sometimes I'll actually do kind of a shotgun effect, which is maybe kind of pre-select with some tannins, but because there is a lot of tannin options and honestly, probably the best way to do it is to call us and email us and try and find out maybe uh, where to go ahead and utilize us. We're around, we're available to call us and ask us. Cause I spent a lot of time people going, look, you have a lot of tannins, there's a million tannins out on the marketplace. Where can I, where, where should I start with doing trials? And yes, that's why we're here because we can help. And especially like Kathy, she goes through so many trials around the world that she's going to be able to help you with that. Would these tannins and oak alternatives be helpful to work with through a one-off Brett problem due to a bad neutral barrel experience. You want to start I mean, on the tan side, Kathy? Um, I think uh, Royal would probably be a good a good starting point um, to help because we have seen that it does tend to um, affect um, some of the Brett 
um, depending, of course, on how bad it is and, 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 and what your levels are. But yes, it can, it is known to be helped to mask um, it. Right, and, and it would be the same with, with thermic oak. Oak is just great for masking a lot of things, right? Whether it's green character, whether it's bread, whether it's uh, smoke taint, EA, oak is just wonderful at that. Um, but you have to taste it and it really does depend on the level of it. Uh, in your opinion about using activated charcoal in combination with tannins to mitigate smoke taint? I mean, we don't really have a whole lot of strong opinions about smoke because it's so right. nefarious, but I mean, I would generally recommend folks remediation, you know, what, however, I mean, carbon is one of the few things that shows actually a change in the values of those compounds. So if someone's going to look at that, you know, enzyme treatment, you know, carbon treatment, and then to build something back with uh, some tannin, mm -hmm. but um, that's, do you, unless you guys have to add anything more on top of that. No, I'd say the same. I'd say remedial activity and then build your wine. Mm -hmm. And then the last question is a question that we already know. Do you have a tannin test kits available? We do. Uh, you can order them online at scottlabs.com or you can call us and we can ship you one. So and can I just go on record? Is a, is, can oh. I add a little quick story? Yeah. I, I really do recommend that even, you know, of course I want you to get a thermic kit, but uh, with the finishing kits, they're fun. I have one at home. And, um, you know, most of us, we're living in our homes these days. And my husband's a winemaker as well. So when you're out and you've got a wine at home that you're like, ah, I don't quite like it. That's what the finishing kit is for. Like you can have so much fun at home, just playing at your research lab, get one for your office, get one for your home. It's fun to play wow. with. And you'll learn a lot. You'll learn a lot just by out what yeah. you normally like to drink and what you can play with. Yeah. <laughs> totally agree. Totally yeah. agree. Uh, and then I'm going to go give you some quick of the polls that we gave out during the beginning. Um, what type of first poll was what type of issues have you used uh, tannins and or oak to fix? The number one hit was lack of tannin and flabbiness. Uh, then it's followed up by unbalanced, then followed up by short finish, then followed up by greenness. So those are the top four reasons why people are using tannin oak. The next one is low aroma. And then uh, a little spottiness with a hot alcohol finish, um, some smoke taint, and some other things that people have done. Oxidation, people use tannin to mm -hmm. fix oxidation, which is kind of interesting to see. Use of tannins. The question was, when are you most likely to use enological tannins? Multiple choice. Uh, by far, the, the, the number one hit was during fermentation. Number two hit was during aging and cellaring. Number three hit was during finishing. And then there was a little smidgen of me that said, uh, they don't use tan enological tannins at all. Poll number three was, have you ever used oak alternatives such as staves, blocks, cubes, chips, or dust, not including tannin? The number one hit was chips, uh, followed by blocks, cubes, or dominoes, and then uh, staves, and then barrel inserts. So that kind of makes sense to me, actually. That intrinsically kind of makes a lot of sense. Chips are by far the most popular, uh, given the options, at least for today. And the last final uh, poll was uh, timing for oak. When do you normally start to think about using oak alternatives? The most of you said one to two years before bottling, which is an absolutely great answer. The next <laughs> next set said six months before bottling. The next set said three months. Uh, a couple of people said one month before bottling and one person did confirm that they figured, they start to think about it at the bottling, which was kind of a semi joke, but in fact actually could be a real answer because something that's occurred before, if you don't have a lot of time um, to figure this out, or you're, you're not running into enough time to do the oak trial on this lot of wine, you could also just set it up so you can verify for the next time. What size micropipette is needed for the finishing kit? Uh, we have a 20 to 200 microliter um, micropipette. Um, and then you can go from there, or if you have, you know, between 10 and a thousand, um, but um, the one that we have available, if you don't have one in your lab, um, is, is the one that we have. But any micropipette, and then you just, you know, depending, because we, on our dosage chart, um, it shows you uh, different um, sample levels. So if you're using a 25 mil sample, 50 mil sample, 375 or 750, It'll also give you the amount of um, microliters or milliliters that you're going to need to use. So, um, as you get more wine and 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 higher dosages, you are going to need um, you know a different one. But 
Uh, right. the, the standard one that we're using is 20 to 200. And then the thermic bench trial kit, that's something they can order from, the, it's not on the website, right? Or it's it on, on the www.oaklab.com website. Oak Lab. Okay, yeah. that's where it's at, Oak Lab guys. And, if you want the you third bench trial kit, it's Oak yeah, Lab. And you, or, or you can certainly call in and ask and they'll probably shoot you to me and we'll, we'll get you set up. Well, cool. Well, that's it. Well, thank you guys again for your time. I can't stress that enough. If you get a chance, please submit. If there is a survey, please submit to the survey. Our upcoming topics are based on your comments, so see, keep them coming. This was, again, you know, a, a starter webinar when it comes to tannins and oak to get you kind of in thinking about the timeline, get you kind of thinking about bench trials. We'll definitely dig a little bit deeper in as time goes on. I, I swear we could spend a whole webinar just on one particular tannin. So don't hesitate to reach out if you have any other questions or comments as we believe in continual improvement. My email is darrenm at scottlab.com, darrenm at scottlab.com. And we post the webinars on our website. Just Google Scott Labs webinars. It should show up in the search results. Thank you, Kathy and Cynthia, for your time. And thank you all so much for all of your time. All of us at Scott Labs want to wish you and your family's health and happiness. And I hope you guys are doing great. Any other final comments from Cynthia or Kathy? Nope. Just, just Thank bench you. trials, bench trials, bench trials. And get exactly. a bench case at home. Bench trials, yes. Don't <laughs> hesitate research. to call. Call us, bench <laughs> trials. Call us, <laughs> bench trials. Call us, <laughs> bench trials. <laughs> We're you desperate for you guys. Thank you all for yeah. coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys. Thank you very much for, um, for your time. So we'll see you guys later. Bye.